General for giving me that permission, because if I had to walk over to the <laughs> podium, it would t use all of my allotted time, the speed that I'm moving these days. Well, these are three terrific, I'm supposed to, I guess, comment on these three terrific presentations, all, all quite different. Um, and kind of, I guess, as the last speaker of the day, sum up what has been a terrific day organized by President Wu and his staff. It really, each of the panels have been very, very substantive. And I think using this format of speaking for 10 minutes, having time for interaction has been very, very effective. So I, I compliment you on that. Before turning to the presentations itself, I, I always, when I come down to Washington, as Alan knows well, I used to live here, but don't anymore for reasons that we all understand, which is Washington is a funny place, and what's going on and is a true impediment to constructive U.S.-China relations is there are a lot of people who benefit from not having constructive U.S.-China relations, and they live in Beijing, and they live in Washington, and it makes it tough. So it really makes it tough. So one of the things I always urge is greater transparency in knowing who you're speaking with and what their incentives are, whether it's talking to colleagues in China or colleagues in Washington as to you know, what, what is driving them, because that is, that is very important. Um, I also, I guess Joanna's left, but Melanie, they raised, Melanie and Joanna both raised a great point which is, you know, I always look for little ways that the United States and China can cooperate, because that kind of, they become confidence building measures which then lead to, to better relations generally. And they talked about, uh, they, I asked them a question about shale, oil, and gas, and they talked about how China data is closed. It's controlled by CNPC, Sinopec, and CNOOC, I believe, and it's not, it's state secret, you can't get it. So that discourages US companies from going and investing in China. And the reality is, after I left the State Department, in fact, I learned this firsthand, is when you invest, I was worked with companies investing in China, that became kind of a pillar of US-China relations. That the relationships that investors build strengthen the relationship between the investing country and the investee country. So if the data becomes available, as I think you're suggesting, Melanie, and US companies can go there and participate in it, not only does it have benefits for climate change and China's energy situation, but it has a benefit for US-China relations, which I think is, is, is a very specific thing which I think the Chinese government should, should do. Um, Abe's presentation was, you know, I, I'm, I was a refugee. I, I unfortunately didn't serve with, with, with Judge so far in the, in the legal advisor's office, but it was my first job out of law school. So I maintain very close relations with the people um, who worked in that office. And even though I'd left the office, they told me he was a great legal advisor. And having heard this kind of brief, that he just made, I know why they thought you were such a great legal advice. That was a great appellate argument. And I would strongly support, we've talked a lot in a track two dialogue that we have actually with President Wu on the South and East China Seas issues. We've talked about the Philippine arbitration and how in fact we agree entirely with your view that it is a lose-lose. Mm -hmm. That it, it, is a, it is something where no matter what this outcome is, it is not going to be good for international law. It's not going to be good for any of the participants. So what Abe has come up with is a suggestion, which is the US now proactively go and persuade the Philippines to withdraw it, which I think is actually a terrific idea, and that China then receives credit for supporting the status quo. That, and the Philippines receives additional credit for doing the right thing. And I think, I think that, is actually, that is actually very wise and something, again, it's not gonna change the fabric. It's not gonna overnight create strategic trust between the United States and China. But it is going to be a helpful small step in the relationship. And I think our view probably is not shared by the US government, but that's okay. <laughs> 
Um, I believe on the EEZ and on cyber and on infrastructure development, all those are worth serious um, analysis and, and kind of support. You know, if you think about the um, I AIIB policy of the United States, it kind of, it goes back to kind of the first thing I said, which is the, 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 the strategic mistrust. It's, it was just something where you just kind of go, you sit in New York, again, this is not sitting in Washington, you sit in New York and you kind of go, huh? Aren't they doing a good thing here? Isn't this something that the United States should support? Isn't the World Bank president, who is an appointee of the United States, saying this is a good thing? And what are we doing? It, it's just, it's a reflection of something wrong in the, because these are very smart, able people in the United States government. So that there, there's something, there's something wrong that we came to that policy conclusion. Um, you know, Shunding Lee. By the way, were you suggesting that Hillary Clinton was going to be president? <laughs> uh, Jonathan and I looked at each other and said, "Was that your your your?" If uh, the uh, final framework for Iran nuclear deal is done, that can be a very good thing for for her campaign. Uh, for Madame Clinton to inherit from. Mm -hmm. And second question: Were you suggesting we have an international peacekeeping force? in Afghanistan after the U.S. withdrawal? Was that a specific suggestion? Look at what happened uh, in the post-withdrawal situation in Iraq. We need to uh, create some uh, uh, mechanism in Afghanistan, not allow such a mess to recur. That would hurt China. And so China, uh, so China, China you, you're, you're suggesting that China under an UN China, banner, under an international peacekeeping, because China is unwilling to send troops China has a into stake. Afghanistan. China has a stake. China needs to contribute. But it's not China's job only. We need many other countries to work together in a cooperative fashion that could have, have any kind of substance. I'm just trying to be very clear. International peacekeeping, UN auspices, Chinese send peacekeepers. <laughs> Uh, could have any kind of a format of cooperation. I personally, I cannot specify or demand my, my government to do anything, but I think we should be open to anything. But General Chen's colleagues have said specifically that they will not send troops to Afghanistan, but you're suggesting that this is a different structure under... I'm, I'm a non-government, so I have my... Uh, uh, liberty to say non-government things. Oh, but we know how, how closely connected you are with the government, Shunding. We, we, we assume you never speak out of school. But I think, it's an interest, I think it's an interesting idea and one which I think your point on the history of American... I also mentioned that our military medical team should work with American medical, military medical team shelter by shelter in those uh, uh, disease-prone uh, areas. We should find excuse that two armed forces should work together. I, I agree. I justification, agree. Justification, not an excuse. Yeah, justification. I believe we didn't focus much again on the effect, you know, the challenge that the TPP is going to create in the Pacific region for U.S. China relations. Because I, I think, you know, Jonathan's colleagues, I think, have written on trade diversion, and folks at the Peterson Institute have written about trade diversion and what will happen if the TPP, which I believe the Senate today agreed they're going to give this authority, TPA, TPA oh, okay. to the president, which is quite a big wow. step forward in terms of allowing the U.S. negotiators to complete the agreement with the other parties, um, that will if this does indeed get completed, it will lead to an interesting relationship, and I hope not competing trade blocks, and I hope not, and I hope that China very soon enters into discussions to become uh, a member of TPP, and I strongly support Shen Dingling's view that we should, in the interim, uh, enter into discussions for a bilateral free trade agreement, which would, which would help um, obviate some of the 
trade diversion created by, by TPP. And in the interim, in the very short term, I strongly hope that, that um, the negotiators complete a bilateral investment treaty, which will allow for, you know, at least prevent investment diversion, which would be, um, which would be, which would be dangerous. Um, I think your suggestion, Dingley, on, on kind of uh, the denial of the supercomputer chip is one which need, I don't know enough of the facts, but certainly I have seen plenty of cases where um, asserting or, or, or guaranteeing that it will be for civilian use allows for the export of things which, if they potentially had military use, wouldn't, would be prevented. Um, so that's something which is, which is, I think, a solution to, again, it's not going to create strategic, mis it's not going to fix strategic mistrust, but it's um, uh, certainly, a, a, it's certainly worth a try, because there is the history, I think you're, you're pointing out on the history of, of when we deny um, licenses, just create, what, to whom we deny the license, they either get it from a third party or they develop them t it themselves. So neither is particularly useful um, to the United States. And I think Jonathan's macro view of the relationship is absolutely right. We're entering into some of new, to, to a large degree, to uncharted territory. Um, I think, you know, the lake versus ocean, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, I still believe that the, and it's been, since the days I stopped being Alan's colleague 36 years ago, I still believe the Chinese, are, the Chinese leadership focuses inward and that the anti-corruption campaign that we're witnessing now, coupled with the third plenum reforms, which are so difficult, it's the toughest thing that China has tried to accomplish since Deng Xiaoping's reform and opening, that those two things alone, with an economy that is also transitioning with slower economic growth, forces an inward focus that we in the United States need to understand better. So we've got a great audience, so those are my comments on the presentation, and let me turn it back to General Chen. Thank you. The uh, three speakers presented excellent uh, remarks on challenges and opportunities for our two countries' cooperation now and in the future. Um, Stephen Orleans contributes his conventional and non-conventional wisdom on dealing with the challenges and uh, carrying out cooperation on security issues. Um, I would like to use the the opportunity as chair of the panel to uh, give the floor some good news. The present cooperation on security issues between China and the United States on uh, three matters. Uh, one, cooperation on countering terrorism. China and the USA are committed to uh, sharing information, border control, uh, financing counter-terrorism efforts, and uh, countering terrorism through um, internet or internet. And also, they are committed to uh, beefing up the cooperation on anti-violent extremism. Two, uh, cooperation of enforcement uh, at sea. China and USA are committed to uh, uh, promote stability in Northern Pacific. They will carry out cooperation um, targeting anti uh, piracy, trafficking, smuggling, and will carry out joint operations between the two Coast Guards. Three, on cooperation of Ebola. 
at the request of the U.S. government and in close cooperation between China and some of the uh, Western African countries, China provided a lot of uh, financial support, uh, sick beds, and doctors. Um, up to now, we have uh, sent roughly 1,000 Chinese doctors, both military and civilian. They carry out cooperation with American counterparts in some ways. The Chinese doctors are still working there uh, together with the African counterparts. Um, four, on Afghanistan. China and the United States are carrying out diplomatic uh, dialogue. At the request of the U.S. government, the Chinese People's Liberation Army are training the Afghan uh, officers and men in China. And we, we received disabled Afghan officers and men in China, and we give them a proper treatment before they are uh, going back home for the continued uh, fight against the uh, Taliban. And we asked the Pentagon for joint exercises among the, uh, among the task force, which has not been uh, responded yet. And we are pushing the Pentagon to give a proper uh, answer to the Chinese uh, uh, right request. Uh, fifth, on cooperation of uh, cyberspace or internet. China and the United States are committed to jointly fighting against uh, children uh, pornograph on internet or cyberspace, money laundering, uh, trafficking of uh, weapons, and other organized transnational crimes. Um, sixth, on humanitarian uh, relief and uh, uh, rescue. China and the United States, I mean two militaries, are carrying out joint um, exercises on humanitarian relief and disaster rescue. In, in 2013, 2014, and in 2015, we have the same plan to carry out the same kind of uh, uh, exercise. In the framework of the ASEAN Regional Forum and the ADM Plus or the Defense Ministerial Meeting uh, Framework, China and United States uh, have been involved in exercises in Southeast Asia. So on six uh, cooperation projects, we have been fully involved up to the neck, and uh, we shall continue to carry out those cooperations. Uh, we will explore more areas of cooperation. So this is what I uh, wish to add to what three um, presenters uh, give us the uh, remarks. Now I turn the floor to uh, Kuz and uh, questions and answers. I will take three questions and then uh, three panelists might uh, answer any of their questions. Um, I have a point, it seemed to me, um, being, uh, I always say, I met it in a way tangible and intangible throughout today's panel discussion. I mean, the anti-corruption cooperation between the US and China. Now, it's increasingly become a big highlight for the China's new administration. And it's also become a new driver behind our relationship in terms of the future's fabrication of the cooperation. Um, but the, the, uh, we say obstacle is there. We have no such an extra, extradition, you know, the agreement. And on the other hand, we also see America's Julia uh, diction a user will well prevent the executive branch from moving quickly. But the problem is, my view is that neither side, neither side could 
afford to underestimate the real meaning for our future because such an anti-corruption issue has a lot to do with the China's future, with the, 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 what directions the, 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 my country will be heading for. So my question is two. One is for all the panelists. Do you think that both governments could successfully conclude any deal to speed up real or ad hoc extradition of <coughs> the, the, the criminals now who now just are hiding in the US? Second, uh, if both governments could move forward with this, this ad hoc uh, uh, extradition, so in what way China's pu 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 push could be going successful? Thanks. For Professor Shen, I noticed your reference to the DPRK and your suggestion, if I understood it correctly, that while it would, might not be possible to roll back DPRK capacity, for nuclear weapons development, that it might be possible to achieve a freezing. Um, how likely do you think that this, is, this would be and that you would have U.S. cooperation in the near term? This is an issue that's disappeared temporarily, but if the past is of the last quarter century is accurate, it'll come back to haunt us again. Thank you. Uh, I've never met you before. So. I know you. Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Sofer and Mr. Orleans uh, and, and Sean Dingley, you all mentioned some very um, uh, specific steps that both sides could take, essentially to, to accommodate key interests or complaints from either side, all of which would be significant changes in current approaches by both the U.S. and the Chinese side. I wonder if you could just talk about some of the political dynamics here in the U.S., and in China, um, of whether or not you see those being, you know, ripe or being able to accommodate these sort of significant policy policy shifts. Both sides have different interest groups that would uh, favor, but perhaps criticize these sort of changes. Whether that's, you know, military, Congress, business community, et cetera. Um, and I would also sort of ask this question in the sense of. Um, both the timeline of the next two years of the current administration, current U.S. administration, and then perhaps more long-term, um, whether you want to go through you know, the, the next eight years when President Xi's in power or longer term, but just thinking about it in those sort of short-term political um, terms. Uh, for the question on uh, cooperation on anti-corruption, I think there is a huge uh, 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 challenges ahead, which is uh, without the treaty, with the treaty, when China say, I need this man back, US would largely uh, send him or her back uh, on certain amount of evidence. Without a treaty, US would say, you need to present evidence. And China say, I want to interrogate this man in order to get evidence. So I, due to the fact that lack of enough evidence, I need this person. So there is a chicken and egg problem. Uh, so if, for your question to have an ad hoc, case by case, successful cooperation, that's simply impossible. But each time US would violate its own principle that without sufficient evidence, they should bring a suspected to China. Uh, U.S. would assume everyone is innocent. Why we should assume everyone is guilty? So I think this is the, 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 the logical uh, legal uh, challenge. Uh, for DPRK issue, I think it's possible. DPRK's purpose is to keep a nuclear weapon, create more nuclear weapon, and with more food and a better life. But if they cannot get both, their bottom line is to keep nuclear weapon and to improve life. Uh, at the cost, not to build up, up new, more nuclear weapon capability. It's like uh, uh, Iran. As long as they would keep the capability to make a breakthrough 15 years later, they are willing to pay a cost that they can roll back a bit, but without uh, total uh, halting their uh, even civilian nuclear program. So when Iran can make a compromise, but still they would have the physical, legal capability uh, uh, 
to, to do more uh, 10 years later. That is where Obama government is vulnerable at this time with the Congress and with many opponents. Uh, North Korea is possible, especially when uh, it, would, it may meet a future green economic situation. It's possible. But Obama government has no heart to accept this DPRK government to allow its virtual maintenance of nuclear capability. Even there is a verifiable, uh, trustful regime uh, to make sure there is no further growth of its capability. Obama government hate to do it. For Chinese government, we have no difficulty. As long as we would have a, a, a capping, freezing, and reversing, and we would, could wait for 20 years for total reversing. But at the moment, without a compromise, situation could become even worse. When DPRK considers it hopeless to improve their life, they would go ahead with nu a more nuclear weapon. So we think a compromise that is not a solution, but uh, does not make things even worse immediately. So we can accept. Uh, that's how I hope my government would work with the US government to have a fresh look. We cannot have a perf perfect solution, but at least we should have a better solution. The essential position that the administration has staked out is that the minimum requirement before the United States would even consider re-entry into some kind of a negotiating process is in fact some kind of tangible evidence uh, of a freeze, uh, if not a comprehensive rollback. Now, the real problem, uh, well, there are many real problems, um, not the least of which, uh, and this highlights, by the way, the difference between the North Korean and the Iranian case. North Korea is the only country that has ever withdrawn from the non-proliferation treaty. North Korea is the only country in the world to test nuclear weapons in the 21st century. North Korea has written nuclear weapons into its constitution. Um, when the United States and China both in their different ways say to North Korea, say to young Kim, you must make a choice, Kim basically says, okay, I choose both. Uh, and we're saying that that's an unacceptable uh, outcome. So you could say to some extent uh, the, the, the liability here is that it leaves North Korea unconstrained by any kind of political or technical understanding, although the cynical view would be, well, if they've cheated before, they'll cheat again. I mean, the lesson, frankly, of the collapse of the agreed framework is North Korea, the good news was North Korea more or less was honoring the terms of the agreed framework. The bad news is, you, high, you know, enrichment was not part of the agreed framework, and they were very, very busy covertly at that time. So at a minimum, it makes, shall we say, the United States intensely suspicious of what North, how North Korea would exploit, exploit this situation. Um, could I also say, uh, is this truly a, a future State Department person out, out, out here? Uh, Oh, you're on the China? Okay, all right, okay, good to meet you. Uh, I think you answered your own question. I think in the prevailing attitudes in this town, uh, to use the title of uh, Leibovitch's book, uh, you're, you're, the, the constituencies here, at least for the moment, uh, are aligned in a way that, um, you know, it's, it's easy to beat up on China. Uh, and whether this changes, I mean, I think that the experience in the past with incoming administrations often has been, you know, the, the tough words on China, which then when the realities set in, lead administrations in a very, very different course of action. But to me, what that suggests, without making a prediction, is that no matter who the next president might be, um, that early on there will probably be tough sledding uh, because the presumption would be that um, somehow, uh, although I, d I doubt many in China would, ag would agree with this, but the, that somehow President Obama has, been, has gone too easy on China and that therefore now we've got to get tougher on China. Uh, but then at some point, and the question is how long would it take before basic realities would set in and you presumably would see more of an intention to, uh, to 
seriously consider possibilities uh, of, a, of a sort that I think most people here would think are very, very much necessary in the relationship. Uh, Dr. Fang, uh, may I say about the extradition issue? Uh, sometimes we can exclude someone who hasn't actually been admitted to the United States. And if you had someone who really was a monster, someone who we both agreed uh, should be excluded from the United States, I can envision that exceptional case. But otherwise, I agree, uh, Dr. Uh, that, Cheng, that, uh, that the, um, uh, the prospects of ad hoc, in effect, rendition, you know, it's what we went through with the whole torture business, um, it's just not the kind of place China wants to go. I mean, I think uh, China would, would be better off seeking an extradition treaty, a formal extradition. We do have an extradition treaty with Hong Kong. And we have actually extradited criminals to Hong Kong. So I would start with that. I would start working with that. And there are two things you need to, you need to overcome. One is you have to have a political uh, offense exception. Uh, and I don't think that would offend China. It's a historical element of most extradition treaties. The other thing that's much more difficult is the due process issue. Uh, how do your courts work? Uh, your prison system, and you must be ready to actually engage with the United States in a negotiation about that and allow, in effect, that flower to grow. Yeah, take your time, develop it, and make, make it ready for the right occasion. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hold back. I would get it process going. And I, I don't think the State Department would be averse to getting a process going, as long as you didn't have overblown expectations. On the other issue um, from the China desk, um, I can only tell you that uh, people felt the same way about the Soviet Union uh, when I was serving under George Shultz and President Reagan. Um, they shot down the Korean airliner in cold blood. And I haven't heard of anything China's done recently that compares with that. Um, so, Ray, uh, Secretary Schultz went to Reagan and convinced him that uh, it was not productive to refuse to talk to someone we needed to talk to in our own interests uh, because they were acting in a way we wanted to convince them not to act. So once he had Reagan on board, then they developed a strategy with a fantastic group of State Department officials. I mean, we had Roz Ridgway as Assistant Secretary for uh, Soviet Affairs. And it, it was a staggeringly brilliant and, and uh, capable group. And they developed uh, a strategy for approaching Congress. So you had um, the State Department doing its work with the White House behind it, approaching Congress in a very forthright way about the need to engage the Soviet Union. And that is the way we achieved the permission, in effect, of the Senate and the House to proceed with that kind of a negotiation. There's something fundamental that's gone on in Washington since those times. And that is that foreign policy is increasingly driven in, by the White House. And I certainly admire the brilliance of many of the young people there. But I think that there's a great deal missing in the way our government works by giving a lesser role to secretaries who have been confirmed by the Senate, who are known to the senators and admired, generally speaking, and their experienced staffs who produce great work. And so I think there needs to be, this issue needs to be thought through. And, um, we need to learn to overcome these problems in the traditional way that our government has overcome these problems and manage to engage with people, with states that we have problems with. One is, is I, through the judicial assistance agreements that we have with China, we still can aid China in returning some of these corrupt officials. I think the problem is actually more a political problem. And the political problem is that the Chinese judicial system in the United States has virtually no 
credibility. It is the part of the Chinese system that the American government and the American media and the American public respect the least. That when we read in the newspaper every week that people have been arrested for the crime of what's called picking quarrels, it does not add to the credibility of the Chinese judicial system in the United States. So if you are sitting in the US Justice Department working on returning a corrupt official who I strongly believe should, be go should go back to China and his assets should go back to China too, he's sitting there thinking, is this evidence true? Is this evidence doctored? Is this another picking quarrels kind of case? If I don't, act, if I don't work with them, if the person doesn't go back, my career's okay. If this person goes back and I'm wrong, and in fact, it's ultimately a political persecution, even if it's impossible in a real way, the lack of credibility in the Chinese judicial systems system makes that bureaucrat adverse to taking the action to return the corrupt official. So I think that's an underlying issue. When Wang Qishan talks to Secretary Johnson and others, that is an underlying issue which is going to need to be resolved and is very, very, very tough. I think there's certain issues going to the State Department question. The bilateral investment treaty will not have congressional opposition. The U.S. is basically open to investment. The bilateral investment treaty is going to level the playing field for American businesses in China. So that's one where the resistance is going to come from Chinese enterprises that fear the competition of U.S. companies. That if the bilateral investment treaty goes through, it's going to be U.S. companies that are able to go and compete Better. So the resistance will come from within China, not us. When I think of Abe's EEZ idea, um, there is a group, a very nationalistic group in China that if the Wai Jiao, if, the, if the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the PLA is seen as acquiescing to allowing American intelligence operations within the EEZ, the attacks on them on the internet in China and on those who make that decision will be tremendous and they, their careers would be at risk if they took that decision. So there, again, I think the resistance is, is, uh, is in China. But each of the different issues, there are different pockets of resistance you know, throughout, but some, you know, I, I always go for the low-hanging fruit, go for the easy deals. And I hope the Chinese government and discussions suggest they do understand that the BIT, the Bilateral Investment Treaty, is low-hanging fruit and will substantially enhance the relationship and become a legacy of President Obama. Obviously a treaty, it needs the advice and consent of the Senate, but that would be left to the next Congress. Okay, uh, we have five minutes before we conclude the uh, session. Uh, one, one question, please. Please. You? All right, I, I just want to say I, I compliment uh, Judge Sefer uh, on uh, bringing a lot of wisdom here. I do question what can be done right now. And I would suggest adding to the chairman's list an interim policy for between now and the time that we're all worried about when shooting starts in the South China Sea. And I would just make two points, and the first is that there has been cooperation between the permanent members of the Security Council in dealing with piracy. And there are people that know a lot more about that than I do. But that's one point. And the, the second point is that some people may have forgotten that in the Korean War, the UN flew a flag. And maybe one of the ways we could get some police activity 
in that region would be to have Coast Guards from maybe ASEAN and China and America and whoever else the nation's interests involved want to have come in and do uh, start with a search and rescue joint maneuver, but maybe with a UN flag so that it isn't something that is going to have any implications for uh, sovereignty. Oh, it's a co comment. That, that was a comment. Okay. <laughs> yeah, on Afghanistan, that was very good news that you had about the diplomacy on, uh, uh, between China and the U.S. on Afghanistan, because I think that that's the area which is going to be very critical to be the one that, where the U.S. has an interest in cooperating. Uh, the U.S. has given a lot of blood and treasure in Afghanistan. They're not going to let that fall into, uh, into a chaotic state again. China is a neighbor. Uh, that's where the one belt, one road is going in that direction. And if there's this terrorism threat, it's not going to succeed. They're building the, ro the railroad through Pakistan now, and the Pakistanis have, have really cleaned up the area. The defense forces have moved in chasing out the Taliban. They've gone to Afghanistan, but they can be back anytime soon. So that there's a common interest here that can't be avoided. It can't be done individually by the U.S. Or by, or by China. And whether or not China contributes military forces, has peacekeeping forces, or whether they uh, give back up in terms of infrastructure investment as the United States and other countries try and, and improve the defense situation of the Afghan forces, I think uh, that, that cooperation is going to be necessary. And I, I think if you want to comment on, on the importance of this for China, I think these discuss some discussions have been going on for some time now, but obviously we've reached a point where we have some agreement, and I think uh, that would be an important uh, outcome. Uh, in the U.S.-China relationship. That might point in, in the right direction in other areas as well. Good. Just uh, comment again. Yeah. A question? Okay. Cooperation, I think, that we could uh, examine a little more is cooperation in maritime law enforcement against non-traditional threats. We have a, a very good 15-year history in the Northeast Asia Coast Guard Forum of cooperating in everything from uh, uh, interdiction of uh, trafficking to uh, even exchanging people on uh, ships uh, with the new four agencies consolidated in the China Coast Guard uh, and with ASEAN having a, uh, uh, through their some of their bodies, uh, including uh, intercessional on uh, maritime security, uh, this is an area where we could do. And at the same time, there's one other thing. We can take the conflictual edge, mostly in the South China Sea and East China Sea, off if we do, as uh, was alluded this morning, we fill that gap in the Q's instance uh, voluntary agreement that exists, uh, the gap that it does not include Coast Guards. Uh, in fact, U.S. Chief of Naval Operation proposed in his uh, first ever visit of an officer to uh, the State Oceanic Administration that runs the China Coast Guard last July, he proposed that uh, Cues be extended to uh, the Coast Guards. Thank you. Try to be brief. Uh, the question about uh, environmental impact assessment in the South China Sea. Uh, we know that uh, last week, uh, more far spokesperson said that uh, EIA and monitoring activities have been done in the Spratly Islands. Now, my question is to Professor Sandin Lee. So, um, under China's environmental law, how early the environmental impact assessment should be done before the start of a land reclamation uh, work in the Spritly? And is it, if it's done, is it any possibility to have that kind of publication of the official report regarding land re reclamation work and monitoring work in the future. So, and the second question, very quick, arbitration. I heard President Olin, or Dr. Sofar, mention the possibility to push the Philippines to withdraw the arbitration case. Is that true, the US, US government is considering that? Not at all. No way to do that. Or oh, maybe we can see the wistful thinking. Thank you. We're suggesting that they should consider it, but I don't, I, Abe, I'm not aware that we they are considering it. two people in favor of it, yeah. Keep trying. 
two refugees from the legal advisor's office. Uh, our foreign ministry has uh, pointed out that uh, we made uh, environmental uh, assessment uh, on our work to uh, strengthen those rock for uh, civilian uh, purposes. Uh, but there are no details leaked as to how such uh, environmental impact analysis has been made. And, uh, but they must be made prior to such an activity. Uh, it ca cannot be made after that. As, as, otherwise, you can make a damage, and uh, you cannot uh, undo, undo the damage. So I presume that these were uh, assessed uh, prior we carry out such activity. Coming to the end, and the whole conference uh, is uh, coming to the end. I think it's a great idea to organize the international conference on China-U.S. cooperation on global security challenges by uh, using the opportunity of launching Institute for China-American Studies. It's a great uh, intervention. I want to extend our congratulations to President Wu for this wonderful idea. And also, I want to take this opportunity on behalf of President Wu to thank all the participants who have spent the whole day on this uh, conference. I think uh, the whole uh, conference uh, has produced a lot of good ideas. For instance, the United States government will, uh, will advise the Philippine government to withdraw <laughs> the accusation. Anyway, lots of good ideas, a lot of suggestions. We are looking forward. We are looking forward to more and close cooperation between our two countries, not only on security issues, but on many of the issues of our common concern. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. So everyone is welcome to join us upstairs for a reception. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's at the Colonnade Room. It is